there really is no need to be a cessationist or a continuationist. Instead, be like this. There's an argument on two different sides, one that says we should exemplify and be just like what we see in the Bible, the apostles, the, the prophets, like Jesus. And then there's another side that says, no, we're not like them. And that the Holy Spirit is not moving in mankind like he did then. So the question is, what is the truth? Well, I submit, and I say this to both sides, to the cessationists, you don't even have to really make that point, that argument that certain gifts have ceased. Here's the reason why. Number one, the more you make that argument, people are still not going to listen. Those that are just bound and determined to try to exercise themselves in that gift, no matter how many times you say it. And those that are going to listen, they're going to listen because they value the scriptures. That's not to say that charismatics don't value the scriptures. But my point to the cessationists is that they are going to listen to your words, to the scriptures. And so they're not going to be impressed by something that is not that is not true, something that's fake. Secondly, you could be wrong. You could be wrong that there are no gifts that are being exemplified and used or moved in a person, however God might want to. And so what I would say is this, because there's a tendency to maybe overcorrect, what you want to do is what you say you want to do, and that is to stick to the scriptures. So every time that you see a case or someone brings up an example of someone misusing or abusing what they call the, the gifts, the spiritual gifts, then just point to the scriptures. Just like First John tells us that not every spirit is of God, so we test them. How? By the scriptures. One of the leading passages that we have to always govern ourselves by is 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And this is Paul talking to the church about having this unity. And so he says, uh, and using him and Paul as an example, he says, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake, why? So that in us, you may learn not to exceed what is written so that none of you become arrogant. What happens is we know, granted, there are people who become arrogant because they have these displays to what looks like to other people as the manifestation of the spirit. And what happens if you're in a charismatic or Pentecostal setting? I've been there. It's been for the last 30 years I've seen this. If you speak in tongues or if you fall out or you prophesy, it doesn't even matter in many cases if it's legitimate or not. People are still going to clap. People are still going to praise God. Even if it's illegitimate, they might think it is. And so there is going to be this bit of a reward, uh, people validating you as being used by the spirit. So all you can do is all you can do, which is to go to the scriptures and compare what you see and then make sure, validate, verify it by the scriptures. Those people that are going to be those that are going to be bound and determined no matter what you say, no matter what you show them, that are going to listen. Well, those scriptures, the Bible isn't for them. They are more interested in the signs. And so there's nothing that you can say other than what you can say. All you can do is all you can do. And I'm not one that believes that gifts have ceased because of what we read in 1 Corinthians 13. The Bible says that love never fails, but there are gifts of prophecy uh, and they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Now, the reason why I do not believe that these things have been done away with, because it doesn't say so. Verse nine, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Ladies and gentlemen, by the way, this does not mean that we get part of the information and then we can prophesy part of it, even if most of it is correct or half of it. That's not the word that's used here for in part. It's just that we get the information that we do get, however much it is. If it's one part of the entire story, 20% of the whole story, whatever percentage, whatever amount that we get from God, it is going to be 100% correct. It might not be the full of the story, but the part that we have is absolutely accurate and correct. Not that we can come back and say that it is, well, I, got, I heard it right, but I said it wrong. That's not how prophecy works, which is coming to my point in a second, why you should be a biblical continuationist, not a cessationist, nor a continuationist. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. What we can conclude here is that the partial is the, the, the canon. The reason why I say this, that it's not the canon, because once the canon was still closed, people still didn't have the entirety of the scriptures. As a matter of fact, even while this is written, even when these are stated, we still didn't have, when the apostles left, we still didn't fully understand what the complete canon was. And then once it was closed, 
what about the people that don't have a copy of it? What about people who might be in another church, a new church, who don't have, let's say, one of Paul's letters or all of Paul's letters? They may have an incomplete portion of the canon or a couple of letters from the canon, a couple of books. So it can't be that. I think that what we need to do is make sure that we define our terms and make sure that no one hijacks the terms. We don't need to let other people hijack the terms or redefine what these terms are. I think that's part of the bigger problem. When we look at these words, look at it. Prophecy. We assume that prophecy has to always be a foretelling, telling the future. That's not what prophecy necessarily is. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. As a matter of fact, the bulk of prophecy is a foretelling right now or telling a fact. What I mean by that is this, when you speak about what prophecy is, it simply just means to tell, to inform, to utter, to reveal. And you're simply doing that from the person who sent you to do so. In this case, in our case, God, which is why you can have false prophets, which is why you can have prophets of Baal, which is why you can have these Ashereth, these prophets of Ashereth, all these different other prophets, lying prophets that are not of God. All they're doing is just they're telling, they're informing that they're informing from their God, which is no good. But to prophesy is just to tell, which is what all of us are supposed to do. So keep that in mind. So when we say prophecy, we need to move away from thinking that it naturally means to tell the future. If someone says they're telling the future, well, then we hold them as strictly to that as possible, that it must be 100 percent. They don't have to give all the details. But they've got to give details and it's got to be accurate. It can't be vague because we don't see vague prophecies in the Bible. Secondly, about tongues, the word is language. That's what the word glossi means. This is plural. And so where there are plural languages, well, that hadn't ceased. Now, does it have to be a supernatural language? The Bible didn't even say that it has to be supernatural language. It just said that they spoke in these different languages. Could it be just like we take a healing, a healing, we might even credit to God, even if it's at the hands of a doctor and a scalpel, we'll still give the credit to God. And if a person has studied a particular language, could that possibly be God working in that person for the benefit of, of the gospel being preached? Well, possibly, maybe. But the point is, the definition of that word language or glow size is languages. We we stick to the sort of the mid, the medieval definition the way it was in the past, but we don't speak that way. The way this word was used in the middle, the, the, the medieval times or even prior to that as English is forming, we would use this word tongues to refer to languages or even a people group. It was never meant to be some sort of ecstatic language. And so we need to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to what the word means. If someone's going to change what it means, the onus is now on them to determine or to show us that it doesn't mean what we thought it said. It now means this. And then the other word, knowledge. Well, we know that hadn't left. As a matter of fact, we need that. All of these are used for what? For declaring the goodness of God. And so I don't think the Bible teaches that these particular giftings have ceased. Now, do I personally think that that they're in oper operation right now? If they are, I haven't seen them, but I won't deny them, which is why we always say, if someone claims to have a miracle or have done something, then let us all in it so that we can all glorify God. Here's why. In the Bible, one, we don't have a whole lot of secret movements of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit moves on a person in a miraculous way, everybody sees it. Everybody recognizes it. When I say everybody, I mean believers and non-believers alike. And so it doesn't even matter if the person has faith who sees it. They are still going to accept what happens. How do I know? Because even the scribes and Pharisees, the rulers did the same thing, whether it was Jesus healing someone or whether it was the apostles being rebuked for a miracle. They said that we cannot even deny ourselves that something has occurred. And so if something occurred, we will know. So I would caution the people that are a continuationist, that are charismatic, not to be so secretive. Not to hide the footage if there actually is footage. We never seem to see any footage. And so I don't know if, if, if God is moving that way. I know this, that God has moved in periods, in times, and then ceased to do so over the course of time. But it doesn't mean that he had ceased to do so um, totally. And so there are people from uh, who went between Genesis to Moses who never got to see a miracle at the hand of a man, who after Joshua 
up to Elijah and Elisha never got to see a miracle at the hands of a man, these miraculous signs. And then after Elijah up to Jesus and the apostles never got to see miracles at the hands of a man. Did God do miracles? He's always doing that. That's who he is. And so the normative thing scripturally is that miracles and signs and wonders did not occur often at the hands of men because there was a purpose for these things. Now, does that mean that they have stopped because we might be in a new dispensation? They could be. But what does the Bible say? If you have these particular gifts, as Paul says in Romans 12, he says, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many, speaking of the body, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And look what he says. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each, given to us, I'm sorry, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. In other words, smoke them if you got them. If you got the ability, if you got the ability to heal, get to heal. If you got the ability to, to speak in these languages, get to speak in these languages. If you got the ability to prophesy, whatever. Do those things. Now, obviously not on command. You don't have the ability to do them when you want to on command. Why? Because the Bible tells the Bible is pretty clear. Paul tells in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, going down to first, uh, let's go to verse 11. But one and the same spirit is the spirit who works all these things, distributing each, I mean, to each one individually, individually, just as he wills. So it's not up to me to do any of these things. But if I've been given this gifting or I've been given something of the Holy Spirit, well, then I should utilize those things. The Lord will utilize that in me. Now, it might not be one thing. It might be one thing at this moment, the next thing at the next moment, something else. For example, what was Paul's spiritual gift? What was Peter's spiritual gift? They didn't have just one. It's however the Spirit worked in them, which, is the, which brings me to this point. The reason that we should not focus on the gifts, one, because the Bible tells us not to, but then two, uh, the giving of the spirit, it's the, the gift of the spirit is the spirit. How do I know? Well, let's go to second Peter first. I'm sorry. Acts 2, 38, Peter speaking. And he says, repent, uh, each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And look what he says. And you will receive the gift or giving of the Holy spirit. It's not the word charis charismata or charisma. This is the word Doran, which is the, the gift or the giving of. And so in other words, the gift of the Holy spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift. Notice in Acts 10, 45, he says they were amazed because the gift or the giving of the Holy Spirit had came upon the Gentiles. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, he is the gift, not the gift, not the things that can be a byproduct of having the Holy Spirit. And so however he moved, which is why 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 calls it the pneumaticon, the things of the Spirit, not spiritual gifts. There's a big difference in that. Now understand the point of these gifts are what? Just what Jesus tells us or John tells us in John 20, he says, there are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of disciples, which are not written. But these, what are these? These signs and wonders that Jesus did. So the signs and wonders were for a purpose. They were written. Why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So the point and purpose of these signs are twofold. One, for the benefit of others, because we're told that we don't see spiritual gifts used for other for, for individuals in the Bible. We see them used for other people. And they're always used for the glorification of Christ so that people will know and believe that Jesus is Christ, that God is moving. Every time that in these periods that we see these signs and wonders at the hands of man, be it Moses or Joshua, be it Elijah or Elisha, be it Jesus or his apostles or anyone else. It was always accompanied and centered about magnifying God, magnifying the Lord. And so our job, if we've got these gifts, then to do so. Now, the reason why I'm not a continuationist is because if a person's going to say that he is a continuationist, what are you continuing? You cannot come up with your own version of spiritual gifts. We do not have spiritual gifts 2.0. Know what we have if there is a continuation of the spirit, if he's moving now the way he moved then, fine. But he needs to move now the way he moved then. In other words, we cannot distort it. If you say you have a prophecy and you prophesy and the prophecy is not like it was in the Bible, meaning it was not thorough, it was not complete, it was not perfect in what was given. In other words, there cannot be, you got part of this right part of it wrong. It cannot be that you get, uh, you gave five prophecies and one was wrong. 
if the rest were right or four were wrong and one was right, but you're still a prophet, that's not how this works. That is not a continuation of what we saw in the Bible. We didn't see any prophet, any man of God, true man of God, giving prophecies that were hit and miss. So if you're going to say you are continuationists, well, then continue what the Bible says. If you're going to say that you are speaking in tongues, well, do what tongues were in the Bible. We have one example of these languages actually of hearing what they said. And then if you want to go to Acts 10, where they, they tell us what they were saying, then fine. But every time that we have any sort of description of what was stated in these languages, it was about the magnification of God. They were actual known languages. You cannot come back and decide that because your languages are different now, that's still a move of God. Again, it has to look like the Bible. If you come back and say that these languages are the are angelic languages, fine. I disagree. But if you want to go that route, how did angels speak to human beings? How did humans speak to angels? If there's an angelic tongue, however they spoke, the person hearing heard and understood the other person in their own language. So if angels have a language, if there's an angelic language that we can have, it's still going to sound uh, intelligible and understandable to the person that's hearing it. It will not be an ecstatic or what someone may call gibberish. So it has to be the same way. If you're going to say that you believe in tongues because you're continuationist, well, then the tongues in the Bible are what we're saying are continuing. Not something new, not something, not tongues 2.0. If you're going to say you're continuationist and you believe in healings, well, they have to be like the healings in the Bible. How were the healings in the Bible? Thorough, complete, not over the course of time, not taking medicine. Is God getting credit for someone being healed that way? Sure. Ultimately, God determines who gets healed, who does, who lives, who dies, who's born, who's not born. God is the author of life. God gives life. He takes life. But if you're going to say that you're healing someone and you're laying hands on someone and you're declaring that it better be like the Bible. Why? Because we don't have healings 2.0. If you're going to say that you are continuing the line of healing in the Bible, it needs to look like what we see in the Bible. Again, there's a reason why we have these texts, why we have these scriptures, so we don't exceed what is written. And whether it's casting out demons, as people would say, or other signs or wonders or miracles, whatever it is, it needs to look like the Bible. Every time something happened in the Bible where there was a move of the Spirit, everybody knew, and even the unbelievers verified it and believed it. And then you would have a large portion of folks who would then in turn glorify God, come to him, serve and worship him. So if your signs and wonders and miracles that you say you have, one, are not verifiable, but two, point to you and not Christ, well then we don't have signs, wonders, miracles 2.0. That's not continuing what we see in the Bible. Continuationists today tend not to be biblical. That's why I say I am a biblical continuationist. What does that mean? That means I don't have to go looking for any sort of signs and wonders. I'm perfectly fine if never another sign or wonder occurs before me. Why? Because I've placed my faith in Christ and heaven is my future and his word is good enough and so far, so good. The best that I've ever been in my life has been by me following the scriptures. The most joy I've ever had has been by me following the scriptures. The most peace I've ever had has been by me following the scriptures. The most protection that I've ever had in my life has been because of me following the scriptures. So what I'm going to continue is to continue to follow the scriptures, follow the words of the Lord, the way the Holy Spirit gave us to him. Remember, the gifting of the Spirit, the greatest gift that we can all identify with outside of our salvation is his word. The words were breathed out by the Spirit. And so if I'm going to be a continuationist, how about being a biblical continuations. In other words, continuing the line of following the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit as dictated in the Bible. A biblical continuationist does not need another sign. However, if a sign is shown, if someone speaks in a language, if someone gives a healing, if someone lays hands on someone and that person is healed, then a biblical continuationist will see, you know what, truly, in fact, something occurred and will give glory to God. So I submit to you, to all my continuationist friends and to all my cessationist friends, don't be either. Be a biblical continuationist. If you never see another sign, amen. If you do, and it looks like the Bible, 
what we see in the Bible? Well, then, amen. And shame on anyone else that wants to circumvent and undermine what we see in the Bible and come up with something new to explain away what they've done that is not in the Bible. So, my friends, what you ought to be, according to the scriptures, is a biblical continuationist. Amen. Amen.